Good morning. It's Tama Lundquist, co-president of Houston Pet Set. Tina Lundquist Faust, also co-president of Houston Pet Set. Conversations for the animals. We love our little podcast, and um, we have a really, really cool guest today. We're so excited. Um, we have Miss Janice Bradley. She is the director of communications and publications for the National Canine Research Council. Good morning, Janice. Good morning to you. How happy are you? To be here. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. All Just right. fine, as long as I don't go outside too much and leave the cleats off my boots. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're in a snowy part of the world, right? I am. Yes, all right. Well, we have we finally have some warm weather today, so we're loving. Oh, that's I'm, perfect. I'm sorry. Perfect, no, perfect, that's timing. perfect timing. Who's that? Yeah, tell that's us. That's Tommy. Tommy. Who, who thinks the UPS guy may be here. Oh, oh. Well, Which he feels very much obligated to announce. Well, this would be, this is a great segue into our conversation, Janice. What breed is Tommy? Tommy is actually a greyhound. A lot of people don't actually know what breed of dog that they have, but in the case of racing greyhounds, you do. He yeah. has a he has a tattoo in his ear that tells exactly who he is. Ah, uh, and I'm sure you rescued him. Yes, yes, yes. He never raced, you. but Bless he you. he was bred to be raised. Oh, uh, okay. So, Janice, we're going to talk to you today, or just to let our listeners know about the misconceptions and the the guesses that people use and take to um to identify a breed of dog, especially rescue dogs, because we don't always know. Janice, yeah. what is the NCRC, and who is involved? The National Canine Research Council is. For, for lack of a better term, a think tank, where, where we, we both produce research, we review research, we disseminate research, the best that we can find that has to do with, with the, the canine-human bond. So we're interested in, any, in anything that has to do with how dogs and people get along and things that could cause difficulties in that in that relationship or misunderstandings that's wow. so interesting so, very yeah. interesting yeah. um because we we talk a lot about the canine bond with humans how sometimes we think animals are actually better than humans and make us better people through that bond so i can't imagine i we're we're limited to 20 or 30 minutes today but <laughs> i can't imagine all of the juicy tidbits that you have about dogs. Um, we're fascinated by them and um, makes it difficult to understand why they're abused and misused in our society, but that's a whole other um, whole other podcast. So very interesting um, work that you do. Um, Janice, one of the questions we have for you is the inability for people to identify dogs, dog breeds. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, there's a quite robust literature now. I mean, we know really without much doubt that nobody is very good at trying to eyeball a dog who's not who's not a pedigreed dog and and make very good guesses about what breeds might be in that dog's ancestry. We just we just can't do it very well. And is there's there are genetic reasons for that because the as soon as you mix even two breeds, you've got something that makes buying a winning lottery ticket look like a look like a sure thing. Mm -hmm. It just it gets so complicated. There's so many possibilities, and we've known this for a very, very, very long time. In one of the seminal works on on genetics and and canines was done was came out way back in the 1960s scott and fuller's wow. genetics and the behavior of the dogs and they did some they they raised a bunch of dogs in kennels and and looked at them in various ways and compared breeds but they also did crossbreeding of you know of a parent of a mother of one breed and the father of another breed and what they found was that even in appearance, it was it was a complete crapshoot. The puppies could look like almost anything. Interesting. So I mean, it's fun as a parlor game, mm -hmm. but we're terrible at it. And there's it's there's no reason why we should be any good at it. Right. Well, when you're talking about mixing breeds, you're talking probably mostly about rescue and not rescue animals, but mixed breeds, which tend to wind up 
in our shelters or in rescue groups, um, how does that impact what um, what happens to um, animals? How does that impact what happens to them in shelters or with rescue groups? Is there a um, is there a correlation between their outcome? If the there, there's not really a correlation in the out in, in the in the outcome itself. There, there have been a couple of small studies that have tried to look at that. But what, but what can happen is that the dog goes into a shelter and maybe he's brown and brown and white and black. So the shelter workers, you know, say, hmm, I think maybe there's some beagle in there. So we'll call him a beagle mix. And that's okay. It's kind of fun. It's kind of it's kind of fun to make these guesses. And it might be true. It might not be true. There's there's really there's really no way to know to have any evidence short of a DNA test. But what can happen then is somebody comes into the shelter and walks down the row and says, you know, they're looking for a nice, say, small to medium sized dog. And, and, and they like the, they, they, you know, like the looks of this dog and he's, he's friendly and he's coming up to the, up to the door and, you know, greeting them. And then they look on the kennel card and it says beagle mix and they say, oh, I don't want that dog. He's going to bark all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. That's really where this, the guessing game can have consequences for the dogs because people imagine that, that they're going to be some sort of behavioral implications based on what was a wild guess in the first place. Janice, what do you think a solution is <clears throat> to that? Is it Would it be better to, uh, be, it would get very expensive to um, genetically test all these animals. We can't really guess. Is it better just not to put a breed on that, that tag of that dog? In a word, yes. Yeah. And there are more and more shelters now that are doing that. Mm-hmm. That are that are just leaving the leaving the the breed space blank yeah. on the on the kennel card. They no longer include that. And instead, what they do is is post descriptions of the actual dog that they see mm-hmm. in front of them. Yeah. And whatever experiences that they've had, you know, with the dog. So they can say, you know, um, Gonzo is a is is a medium size, you know, about about thirty five pounds. Brown, multicolored, multicolored dog who loves to play fetch, mm-hmm. but isn't doesn't seem to be crazy about swimming. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. that's real information. Yeah. yeah, that's something that that people can say. Okay, that sounds like a dog that might have actually actually worked, you know, with my lifestyle. And that is so important, that lifestyle, the characteristics of a dog, because you might like a certain breed, but if you get a dog that is hyper, hyper, hyper it needs, even in a breed specific dog, it needs to be walked two to five miles, three times a day, just to maintain his, his happiness. But you're really a hard worker and a couch potato at night. Your lifestyles are not going to match. It doesn't matter how much you like a breed or not. If you don't have that, it's like marrying the wrong person. It's not going to work for you. We have some really good partners <clears throat> in your um, neck of the woods too, Janice, and they have a whole matching system for adopting dogs. It's called How I Met My Dog. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Yes. And we we love that it's almost a match game for them. They uh, take the characteristics of a person and the characteristics of a dog without even talking about the breed of a dog. And and they match them through an algorithm um, online. So these, these, um, this computer decides who you are a good match with in their library of dogs or who the dogs are a good match with in their library of people. So the dogs also, they say the dogs also have a voice then when they get placed because their characteristics are being matched with the characteristics of a person. So that dog might be happier also. Um, Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah. And those kinds of matchmaking systems can be, you know, can, can be really helpful. I want to put a caveat on that to begin with though, because We've got more and more evidence that both dogs and people are, for lack of a better term, love the one you're with species. <laughs> and it's amazing how much we can adapt to each other, even, you know, notwithstanding whatever expectations that, that we had. We know, we know a lot about 
what what we used to call you know behavior problems in dogs and we we used to really think that those you know could jeopardize a dog's success in a home and now we've been uh, a colleague and i have been doing some work on three different papers for 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 several years that 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 seems to indicate that most people have aspects you know qualities in their in their dogs that they that that they would prefer that they not have you know sort of like their spouses <laughs> and their friends but it doesn't necessarily jeopardize the relationship right are you okay. thinking of what i'm thinking what tass oh yes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my baby the best little gorgeous little westie so much energy so 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 much energy you adapted and oh. he was the love of your oh, life God. Hi, oh, Tommy. Tommy. Hi, Tommy. Tommy. Good boy, Tommy. Can we stop? Was that a bicycle? So exciting. <laughs> can we stop, please? Thank you. Good boy, Tommy. Can you adore voices? Thank you. Oh, there's somebody. Oh, it is the UPS guy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> told you, Mommy. I told you. He was right. They usually are. It's yes. really, really, really important to him. Yeah. And that, that's definitely an example of, of a behavior that I would prefer that he not do. Mm-hmm. However, it in no way puts our relationship in jeopardy. Yes. Isn't it amazing how we're so much more accepting of um, kind of a mismatch in an animal than we are in people? Like, uh, I just love my dogs for who they are. Um, but back to your point about Taz, I definitely had to adapt to this Westie that was just so much more than I ever thought I'd be able to handle. And um, it was worth it. I mean, he was the love of my life. Yeah. But yeah. but he was, yeah, he was in, he'd got th- kicked out of multiple um, doggy daycares. He was peeing on the mayor's Yorkies. He, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, he picked I a have fight. stories, Janice. He I picked have a stories. <laughs> fight with a, a huge Weimariner and a Doberman at the same time. I mean, oh, yeah, goodness. but he was just unflappable. But I loved him so much, and I loved that he was so spirited. And um, I think his strength gave me strength sometimes because, yeah, um, yeah he was he was just seventeen years of of wedded bliss. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the, Janice, the bonding, we're going to. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to remind our listeners that we're talking to you, Miss Janice Bradley, Director of Communications and Publications for the National Canine Research Council, doing very important work on the breeds of dogs and, and many other things. So, thank you for joining us today. And I wouldn't want to give the impression that that matchmaking is, is not useful. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, for one, don't actually trust myself, you know, and I'm supposedly an expert on dogs to choose my own dog. I would rather, you know, tell the, tell, tell the person who's bringing the dogs in what I need. And Tommy's an example of that. I had, I had another greyhound when I, when I decided it was time to, to, to get her a friend because she fell in love with a friend's dog and was, was heartbroken without him. So I decided she needed, she needed a companion and but but she was quirky in the way that she played and she would sometimes put dogs off and if they responded you know by appropriately telling her that they didn't care for that then she would become you know distraught and terrified so so i told the people at the rescue i knew i wanted another greyhound just because i like the way they look you know and that's i'm i'm mm-hmm. free to to you know choose a breed mm-hmm. because i like the way it looks as long as i don't assume that it actually means anything mm-hmm. in in how the dog is going to behave and what i told them i needed was a was a dog who was who who was really really good with other dogs who could adapt his play style and get along regardless of how sort of you know quirky the other the mm-hmm. other dog was and so and so they sent me tommy yeah I feel the same way. I think if I ever, I let the dogs come to me now, but if I ever had to go out and actively seek a dog, I would do it based on uh, kind of how I met my dog, how the, the way they do it and that matching of characteristics, because that's important to me. But that being yeah. said, I've got a bitey little active chihuahua and I, I sort of love him, you know, and, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and he's, and he's fine. He's not, he's not something I would ever have picked, but I do love him. I do love him a lot. So I did adapt. And, um, I guess, I guess we're, we're right on both accounts. You know, you, you yes. can, you can match those characteristics, but you can adapt as well. Yes. Well, um, 
Janice, tell us a little bit about um, the discrimination of certain um, breeds in our society today. Um, I know we've gone through kind of a um, transitions over the years where we've there have been dogs that have been popular that have been you know in movies or TV commercials and that becomes kind of the dog of the the year or dog of the decade and then people get them realize that they're not a match and and furthermore like all the way up to pit bulls you know there's there's definitely a discrimination on the breed and we could also talk about pit bull not being an actual breed people think it's a breed but it's not that was a lot <laughs> Why don't I start? I'll start kind of at the end of that. There, there's a long, long history in this country and in other countries of scapegoating specific breeds of dogs. There's a couple of really good books on this. Karen Delise wrote a book called the called the Pitbull Placebo, and Bronwyn Dickey has a has a wonderful book. Very, she's a she's a journalist has a wonderful, very very deeply researched book that's just called Pitbull. It's called the, the something of an American icon. In any case, they both, both, both of those authors talk about the history of this kind of scapegoating. And it didn't start with pit bulls. Right. If, you, if you go back to the 19th century, you're talking about um, bloodhounds, various kinds of bloodhounds as being the dogs that everybody was terrified of. And, and um, for a while, both Dobermans had a really bad reputation. Um, German shepherds had, you know, were the were were the demon dogs until Rin Tin Tin came along. Mm. Remember Rin Tin Tin, mm-hmm. and almost almost single handedly sort of, you know, fixed the reputation of those dogs. There was there was a point in 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 New York in the in in the early twentieth century where the newspapers in New York were on a tirade tirade about about how all Spitz dogs should be should be mm. gathered up and killed. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I think scapegoating is a kind of social construct, whether whether it's of, of humans or animals or whatever, that that that's very, very common in the face of anything that scares people. Mm-hmm. I think they, you know, want to want to look at look at something simple that they can identify and say, okay, it's about, it's about this group. Mm -hmm. And if we just get rid of this group, we won't need to be frightened anymore. Right. It tends to come up very strongly when there is one of the extremely rare, but very gruesome events that occasionally happens where, where somebody is very seriously bitten or even very, very rarely um, killed by a dog. Mm -hmm. And our, our stone age brains cannot process the rarity of that information because we hear it 500 times. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you hear, and and your brain processes that information as if it had happened 500 times. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So it makes people frightened and makes people motivated to say, we have to do something about this terrible danger. And the answer must be a single group. Yes. I think pit bulls have the, 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 what's really a social construct a pit bull has lasted longer than most of the others. And my own, my own personal guess about why that is, is because it's an easier target because in, in point of fact, there's really no such thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's whatever anybody says it is. So if you're talking about Doberman pinchers or you're talking about German shepherds or you're talking about blood animals, those are actual real breeds. Mm-hmm. They, they, they exist. You can identify them and it makes it easier to debunk. Mm-hmm. Eventually it fades away, you know, in the, in conflict with people's actual experience of, of lots of nice dogs. And they know they can, they can know what breed, at least the pedigree dogs are, but with pit bulls, Anybody, whatever anybody says is a pit bull is a pit bull. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. It yeah. just, it, it, it's, it's become not at this point, almost nothing more than a, than, than a, than a social construct construct. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. you know, is it these three breeds or these 10 breeds or a dog that has, you know, one drop of tainted blood from one of these breeds or a dog that has a certain proportion of, 
of the, the size of its forehead, you know, in comparison to the, to the, to the size of its jaw. It, it's just anything that anybody says it is. So that's a perfect characteristic for a scapegoat. Yeah. Do you, um, uh, is your council working on debunking some of these myths? And do you have data yes. to back up yes. why you should debunk these myths? Yes. Yeah, we work on that quite a lot. We're concerned about any kind of bias that's that's applied to to particular dogs and the people who own them. So so yes, those those are priorities. Janice, if I could ask one question, and and um, maybe this is kind of outside of of what you do, but when we go to the shelters, we see a lot of the block headed. Most of what's left in the shelters are the block headed animals. They're the most difficult to um, to move. Sometimes we do transports, so you know we can only mix in like two block headed dogs with a bunch of puppies. Why do you think that is? Is is why do we see so many in the shelters? Why are they so? Are they bred more than other animals? Um, why has this become? Beyond what you said before, why has this become such an issue in terms of rescue? Um, why is it? Why are we as rescuers challenged with so many blockheaded animals in our society? I mean, the most likely explanation is 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 simply that, at least in some regions of the country, then this is not true in all regions of the country, but in some regions of the country, there are probably just a huge population of dogs. That, that happen to have some part of that morphology. Mm-hmm. And it's a very flexible, mor- morphology is just a fancy scientific word for what, it, what an animal sure. looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it, it could simply be that since the morphology of identifying a dog as a pit bull is so flexible, you're talking about a really, really huge population yeah, of yes. dogs. Yeah. It's like all, all the poodle mixes out there, you know, there's so yeah. many poodle mixes. And if you were maligning anything that had poodle in it, it would be everything from the flat faced little um, dogs up to like a larger, you know, poodle mixed with a, a, a golden. Uh, golden. Yeah. Yeah. Golden. yeah. So, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, the, and, yeah, and, there, the, and I mean, it's. In, in that case, you're probably talking about anything with a curly coat. Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. And know, again, so, and again, we're basing all of this on the looks of a dog. We're basing right. that on the looks of a dog, and so um, we we think if it's got this or this or this, then it gets lumped into that whole pit bull category based on its looks. Right. Yeah. Which just it, it just doesn't tell you anything about right. the dog. Right. Yeah. I have a pit bull and I have to say he's the sweetest dog I've ever had. Are you sure? The kindest. <laughs> In that broad category. Good question, Janice. <laughs> I on that note, I do have one question. Do the DNA t- yes. tests work or not? I people have told me no, people have told me yes. I have a little dog that I thought was a little black lab. It came back, he has fourteen different um breeds in him not one of them is black lab the 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 more the the more breeds that come back on on most of the on most of the systems the more breeds that come back the less reliable they become okay so most of them are the 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 ones that are out there commercially tend to be pretty reliable at the f1 level so if you've only got two breeds in there Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they they can they can achieve a, a pretty high rate, rate of reliability. Although, again, you can't document that very well with really well with commercially available tests because they're because because their research is proprietary. Mm. So 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 it's not it's not available to look at. But there but but there certainly are reliable genetic identifiers for many, many, many pedigreed dogs okay. that go down pretty, pretty darn well to the F1 level. Okay. After that, after that, then it gets, it, you know, it gets kind of softer and softer and softer and softer. The more, the, the more breeds are in the mix. And it's probably the exception to see a mixed breed dog that's a mix of only two breeds, mm-hmm. as opposed to having a whole lot of mm-hmm. different heritage in there. 
was one fairly large study done in a shelter in, in Arizona. It came out last year, a couple of years ago, that showed that the average dog in that shelter was, I think, I think they found five breeds on the on the DNA. Wow. I could be I could be off. It could yeah. it, it it could have been four. Okay. I'd have to look back at that, but it was a, it was a large population of dogs. And all of our all of our best um, survey data shows that more than half of the dogs in the United States are mixed breed dogs. Yeah. So that's not true in all countries. There are lots of places yeah. in Europe where that's not true, mm-hmm. where where breeding is much more carefully controlled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in the United States, we get a lot of mixed breed dogs. Yep. It's a and, free for all. That thing. speaks it's that speaks one. to what we need to do and start controlling, do more spays and neuters, get the animals off the streets because they are they're not they're not doing well out there. Plus they're breeding and they're breeding exponentially. So one last question and then we have to go. Um do you do cats? Do you do this with cats? I don't do cats. Yeah, my, okay. My only knowledge of cats. Is, I just wanted is, to ask for the as, cat people as a former cat owner, so I yeah. better not speak to that. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, Janice, it was so interesting. I think we could talk forever, mm-hmm. and um, but we love love diving into this, and maybe we'll have you back again and you know take some questions from listeners about about specific things within this category because there's so much that we could learn as rescuers and lovers of all animals. And so thank you for your time. Thank I, you, Janice. I would be happy to do that. And thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Stay warm up there. Bye, Tommy. Do my best. All right. It's gradually getting warmer. <laughs> the lake may thaw fairly soon. Ah, oh, pretty time <laughs> of the year. Okay. We loved um, hearing about Tommy too. Yes. Give him our best. And hearing from Tommy. And yes. hearing from him. Yes. <laughs> Bye, Thanks, Janice. Janice. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.